Hello, hello everybody. Um, sorry, I'm just pouring some water. Um, we are live. Hi everyone. So we are live. We are talking with Susan Orlean today who wrote this wonderful book on animals. I'm really excited to chat with Susan. So let me see if I can make this work. I'm getting better <laughs> at it. Hang on. <clears throat> How's everyone doing? Okay, guys, hang on. I can get the hang of this. Um, and you know what? Let me put in my headphones. Okay, I am good. Um, Jared is not here, he will not be here. So for everyone asking, he is not here. So no more asking. Um, let me find Susan. And if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to uh, comment so we can ask Susan. Um, I really loved this book. It was a lot of fun. How do I do this? Um, sorry guys, just waiting for Susan to pop in. And Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I am. I have been doing this long enough, and I'm still a luddite at technology, so I apologize. Oh, that's a, and listen. I I was looking at Instagram and thought I have no idea how to do this. So someone <laughs> smarter than me is going to have to help. Oh, how gosh. are you? We both. I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm great. I'm sitting out in my courtyard and. Um, with my dogs who are exploring and having a great time. I love it. Well, it looks beautiful and looks like great weather where you are. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles and it's gorgeous. It's oh absolutely God. gorgeous. Where are you located? I'm in Austin. Um, we used to live in Los Angeles and now we've been in Austin for about 10 years. Oh, well, you get great weather too. So, yeah, um, also great. not in the summer though. Don't come in the summer. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, I'm listening to my dogs digging around up there, and I don't know what's happening. So this will be very interesting. <laughs> it's always fun. It's always a crapshoot, I feel like, with animals. You just never know what you're going to get, but it always keeps things entertaining. So Oh, completely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's true. I, um, I worked on a TV show once with a horse, and I felt like no matter what, we knew that the all eyes would be on that horse as soon as the horse walked in because they just you never know babies and animals yeah, exactly um, that's why they always tell uh performers that they never want to follow a baby or a dog yes exactly <laughs> upstaged for sure well, right um, i just want to say thank you i know how busy you are i mean you are one of the most incredible writers you're incredibly prolific I love reading The New Yorker, and every time I see your name, I get very excited. Um, and now with your newest book uh, on animals, which everyone should go out and get if you don't have it already, is fantastic. And I inhaled this book. I was so excited uh, to read all about it. And right from the introduction, I just felt an instant connection because I, too, grew up with all kinds of animals and I always felt like it was just a revolving door from goats and horses and chickens and um, it was always a fun experience so I just loved reading your introduction and then you know all of the stories that followed oh so thank, thank you. you well you know it was a real joy to do you know some books you feel great about and there are tons of hard work and you're happy when they are done and some are a real um, sort of labor of love. And this was very much a labor of love because these stories were ones that I 
enjoyed doing so much and felt so good about. And it was really um, gratifying to put them all together and see them as a whole. Sure. Well, can you tell us a little bit about this process? Um, it's a bunch of essays that you've written over the last, I read, 25 years. Is that correct? Believe it or not, which That's makes me incredible. feel very old. But, um, <laughs> you know, I've been writing about animals since I've been writing. And so stories, you know, very, I get to choose the stories that I want to work on. And so invariably, I get drawn to stories that are about animals. Um, there's so many interesting, I mean, incredible stories about animals out in the world. And stories about animals are always stories about people, um, no matter what. So it's uh, an opportunity to write about people in a in a different way. And when I, um, I think part of this is the nature of the pandemic of feeling like uh, I was reflecting back on work that I've done over the years and looking at them as what what were they trying to say together? Uh, what 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 were the themes that really attracted me and that I revisited over and over again? And it became immediately clear um, that animals were that theme. And oh my goodness, here's I love it. My, my crazy puppy. <laughs> um, you know, so I went back and read them all and uh, did a small amount of polishing just to get them back in, um, you know, update them and correct all the things that I wish I had done differently the first time around. And then we put them together um, looking for an order that would work at, for the reader. Oh, and it was, it was really fun to do. You know, it's a, always an interesting experience to go back and read old work um, and you know, just see, does it hold up? And one interesting thing about animals and stories that involve them is they're kind of timeless. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, we're always grappling with um, some of the same issues about captivity, about um, what it means to live with animals. I mean, those are all issues that we were constantly thinking about and puzzling over. So the stories felt um, timeless, which was great. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that I really noticed is your curiosity, which really shines through. And I know that in the New York Times review of your book, um, all embracing curiosity was mentioned. And they said that there appears to be nothing in the world that doesn't interest Orlean. And I know that I really felt that way reading on animals um, and really felt I, I just felt really sh your sense of curiosity really came through. Now, is that something that you would say is true? And where do you, if that's true, where do you think that curiosity comes from? You know, uh, and that makes me feel really happy to have that stand out. You know, I, I just am by nature curious. I think, I think I became a writer because I'm curious rather than that I was a writer and then thought I should be curious. I think, I was attracted to this work because it gives me a chance to learn about things around me. And I think part of what I really care about is also encouraging readers to think in those same terms and to think that, you know, anybody can enrich their daily experience by being mm -hmm. curious. Um, and, you know, I'm lucky I have a, a job in which I'm allowed to explore my curiosity, which is fantastic. Yeah. And there's almost nothing that doesn't interest me. I, and I know that sounds very general, but um, I just, I, I'm just always interested in learning, even about things that I don't 
like or don't understand. I, I mean, part of me just wants to know, well, why don't I like it? Um, and, you know, the chance to look into some of these stories was satisfying every itch that I had as a curious person. Uh, I'll give you an example. I wanted to profile a show dog because, mm -hmm. you know, I, like most everybody I know, loves to watch the West oh, I... Westminster Dog Show. And yeah. And one day I was just thinking, I wonder what it's like for these dogs when they're not on the circuit. I mean, are they, um, and sorry about my dog barking. He's um, fine. You're in good company. <laughs> he's in a very spunky mood today. Um, <laughs> but I just started thinking, I wonder what it's like for a show dog when they're not on the circuit. I, do they act like normal dogs? Are they always worrying about how they look? I mean, do they roll in the mud the way other dogs do and it just was a chance to go beyond the obvious mm -hmm. so I spent time with this show dog who was a very successful um, in fact that year people thought he would win Westminster he didn't but he he was a serious contender um, and seeing what he was like just as a dog and it, it was so much fun what was that like? First of all, the story about Biff was one of my favorites because I love how you personify him. And even when you're exploring his, you know, sort of realm and you're, you're describing it as pawing through his things. And I just thought it was great descriptions when you were writing about him and just his demeanor and that he loves sex and food. And it, he was a very fun, spunky character to follow along with. Um, what was that like? Did you, what was that experience like? And how did you approach that? Did you, you know, call them up and say, I want to interview your dog and let me see the lay of the land. How, how did that unfold? You know, I approached his owners and said, I was really interested in writing about him and seeing what his life was like outside the show ring. And they were thrilled, you know, they loved the dog and they were very proud of him and happy to have me. I went with him to a couple of shows wow. and spent time with his owners and with his handler. And of course I wanted to spend time alone with, with Biff so that I really got to know him just one-on-one, -on -one, which they found very funny and very, crazy because <laughs> you know it's not as if he was a person who I was spending time alone with people are amazingly open and I have very rarely encountered someone who said no hmm. I think it's partly because they know that I I think I am able to um make it clear to them that I really want to learn their story and um, I don't have an agenda. I'm not trying to make anybody look good or bad or, you know, yeah. sort of, uh, I, I don't come in with a thesis that I'm trying to prove. I really, and look, that's what curiosity is. Right. If you're really gonna think about it, you have to have no preconceptions. I mean, obviously we all, have preconceptions about everything but you need to fight that tendency and allow yourself to really be open and say show me what this is all about um and what i really compare it to is being a student um when you're a student you're obligated to just be really open and and feel like you're in the midst of learning about something. And then as a writer, I become the teacher and I turn to you and say, let me tell you all about this show dog who yeah. I got to know. So um, I'm, I feel like that's the process of the work I do.
Well, and that, I love that. And it shows so, because it, it, every story, there is that element of curiosity of like exploring it in every angle of entry is wildly different, which was so fun. And it definitely as a reader kept me on my toes because I was like, where are we going with this? Where, you know, just the angle of entry was just fascinating and got you right from the get go, which I thought was just definitely coming from a curiosity of like, I need to understand. And this is what my entry into this, you know, being is, and this is their life and this is their job and this is their relationship. And it was super fun. Well, um, that makes me so happy because that if there's anything that I want readers to feel, it's some element of discovery mm -hmm. and some feeling that they've learned something they, they didn't think they were going to learn and that they can experience something that they maybe wouldn't otherwise experience and, and see in themselves the ability to be curious about something you know, I almost never write about things that people think they want to know. And <laughs> I feel like that's, I always think, well, why wouldn't you want to know about taxidermy? It's so interesting. Well, and, I brought mine out just for you today. So. Oh, good. Oh, let me see. Oh, very <laughs> she's, nice. She's not going to win any awards, but this is one of our chicken. This is a chicken. This was Smalls who passed away from, um, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but one of the chicken illnesses that attacked my whole flock. But that's oh no, story. no, no, no! I know. Oh, that's I know. well, you know what? I mean, having chickens is half heartbreak. I think yes, it's hard when you name them and get close to them because some are totally fine and healthy as can be, and then some of them, you know, it's in an instant get scared by a passing raccoon or, um, gosh, I can't think of the name of the virus, but it gets in the soil. Oh, did, and... Yeah. Oh, did they get Merrick's disease? Merrick's, yes. They got all yeah, I, COVID. Yeah, my first, the first chicken I had who died had Merrick's disease and yeah. it was so sad and so, I mean, there's nothing you can do. Were um, you able to um, introduce new flocks or did you have to vaccinate after? Well, I was told that all of mine were vaccinated. That, you know, I mean, if you buy them from a big uh, hatchery, they get vaccinated at birth for Merrick's. And this was really odd that she got it. But the other birds were vaccinated. How strange. And they were Yeah, see, fine. mine wasn't. And so oh. it was just my one bird who died. That's so odd. And we, um, thankfully it was only one. We lost, gosh, like maybe eight um, to Merrick's because we, ours were not vaccinated, which I, I didn't realize. And I, I didn't even think of it because they all came from the same place that we go to this one great place here in Texas and pick them up every year and bring them back. And then during when the pandemic hit, everyone's asking us for eggs and we got excited. And so we got chickens that were older and you know old enough to lay and introduce them and they were vaccinated so I didn't think it would matter but because they were vaccinated apparently some of them already had Merrick's or something and gave it to them yeah whole, I mean whole group. It, 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 it's uh, uh I'm so sorry it's, yeah it's hard I love having chickens but I felt like um it, it just constantly made me cry because yeah. they got eaten. They got, um, yeah, they got eaten by everything, everything. You know. And they all attack them differently. So you know how, what animal it is based off of. Right. Right. Which is so been. weird. And, so and weird. actually the first one that got, the first ones that got killed, got killed, um, by, uh, dogs. My neighbor's dogs. So oh, no. it was very, uh, it was hard. I loved having chickens. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. it they are, they're it's just so much and fun. And yeah. And yeah. having a great, actually, fresh Instagram eggs handle. makes. Oh, dreamy. But there's um, a, an Instagram handle called drinking with chickens. Can you hear me? I'm so sorry. Am I cutting out? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. Can you, you hear, can hear me? me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I have terrible service. Um, there's a great Instagram handle and uh, she goes by drinking with chickens and she does all these cocktails and stuff, but she just, uh, it's beautiful, you know, photography of all of her chickens and her flock. And it's so cute. If you oh don't follow her, you can totally follow her. She's fun. That sounds like my kind of uh, Instagram account. Yeah. Instead of <laughs> right. makeup tutorials, yes. I, I would like uh, drinking with chickens. Yeah, she's super, super fun. Um, I, I love following along with her. But um, yes, I, I loved learning about your chickens and, and how you got started in your um, farm in upstate New York. And um, I, I just loved hearing about all the adventures. I also really loved learning the difference between the donkey and the mule. And I, I, I as a horse person, I didn't even realize the difference. And, um, you know, I just, again, like the curiosity factor and, and just at every angle, I just felt like I learned more. Is there a certain story where you were really shocked or, you know, sort of the most surprised by? Well, certainly, I mean, I was very surprised by almost every one of these stories. The, the mule story was fascinating. I mean, I knew nothing about mules before I started the story. And, I, you know, like you, I wasn't even entirely sure that I knew the difference between donkeys and mules. I didn't know what was special about mules and I absolutely knew nothing about this whole military. Yeah, that um, was interesting. I mean, it was, it was so extraordinary. Um, and or the parachuting when trying to I know, I know. I, I, I mean, that, I was was, shocked. that was quite a, an adventure or misadventure on the part of the U S military, but God, you know, every one of these stories was filled with surprise. And um, I think the one that I got the most caught up in following the, the story and learning about it was about Keiko, the orca whale, who I wrote mm -hmm. about. And um, it was it was just an amazing, strange journey um following the story of this whale who had been captive since he was a baby then ends up starring in the free willy movie and becomes a you know a huge symbol of animal freedom but he was captive right and and then began this many year journey to, to try to set him free. And um, it, it was an amazing, um, complicated story because he, it's not easy to take a wild animal that has been captive and teach it to be free again. Free wild, I'm um, sure. And it, you know, it also raises all these questions about the millions of dollars that were spent, literally millions and millions of dollars that were spent to try to set him free. And, you know, even though many people never felt it was going to be achieved, um, and unfortunately it never was, but it it was such an incredibly interesting story. I think that was the one where I felt like I learned the most and was surprised by pretty much every element of it. Mm -hmm. It certainly seemed like a very grand adventure, to say the least. You know, going from across the country yes. to across the world, by land, by sea, by air. Right. <laughs> Well, even the uh, learning how you send a um, orca whale in a in an airplane was interesting, <laughs> and the fact that um, yeah. they had to, you know, rub him with Vaseline so that he wouldn't dry out. And I, I mean, it, it was really um, it was an amazing story. All, all of the details fascinated me. Yeah, it was um, a great adventure for sure. 
Um, were there any stories that were in the book that you had to omit? That you uh, no, I, I actually, um, you know, one thing I wanted to make sure that none of the stories were outdated in some way. And um, so there was nothing that I ended up having to leave out, which was great. Um, you know, and I, I, I added new material because um, we sold our farm and I wanted to write about um, you know, leaving that kind of paradise yeah. that I, where I had so many animals and that made it so special for me. So that was an important um, addition to the book and new, new material that I wrote for the book specifically. Um, and it, it was a kind of interesting thing to have a final note on the the end of that particular era not that i i mean i have two dogs and a cat um it's not that i don't have animals but i no longer am living on a farm where it's easy to have mm -hmm. livestock so you know it's a really different part of my life and that that's, yeah um I mean, that's something that made writing that last section of the book very um, emotional for me sure. and satisfying, really. Well, and I found it so interesting that while during the pandemic, everyone was sort of romanticizing and moving to more bucolic and rural areas, you ended up moving away from that. So I'm curious to hear why and if you want to speak anything about that and how you're yeah. feeling now. <clears throat> well, I think that um, one of the things that happened during COVID is that people made change. Mm -hmm. I think it was a time where people looked at their lives and said, am I doing what I want to be doing? Is Are the things in my life the way that they are optimal for me. Mm -hmm. And w for a lot of people that meant saying, I don't want to live in a city anymore. I want to live in a quieter environment. For us, it was also a matter of saying it's unsustainable to have, to live in LA and have this farm in New York. Mm -hmm. And it, at a time when travel, you know, in the beginning of COVID, nobody was traveling. And the prospect of going back and forth to New York suddenly seemed very difficult. Like, are we even going to be able to do this? And that, and that feeling of we need to simplify our lives and live in one place and not um, rely on going back and forth so much. So it was a lot of the same impulse. It's just for yeah. us, it meant saying this is too hard to, to live on both ends of the country. Sure. And none of us know, knows what the future holds. And sure. in, you know, and our first thought had been actually let's just go to the farm and stay there. And then um, I think because we were in LA and, and one thing that really struck us is that we could be outside. And I'm sure you experienced this in Austin too, mm -hmm. that um, <laughs> the ability to be outside <laughs> in the middle of COVID was a <laughs> lifesaver. Yeah. Absolutely. So the idea of of going into an environment where, we're, you know, COVID, the lockdowns were in February, and it would have meant several months of just being inside. Um, yeah, and freezing. So it was a Bundling big up. decision. It was a it was a really big decision, and one that I think was the right one, but it was a big a big one. Sure. Sure. Um, 
one of the, you mentioned sustainability and um, one of the things that I actually did with uh, my co-founders during the pandemic was we launched a, launched a company called Town, which stands for Take Only What We Need. And it's basically this um, relationship between people and planet and sort of um, providing solutions and antidotes to burnout and how we can be self-sustaining both for ourselves and for the planet without feeling like you have to give everything up and we completely waste free and sort of living the life that is the most healthy for yourself holistically and, you know, for the planet. Um, I'm wondering what is something that sustains you? Like for me, I also started a book club because I love reading and reading is something that really holistically just makes me feel healthy and, you know, curious and connected um, and also being outside and in nature and animals. I'm wondering if you have something that you feel like helps sustain you? Uh, being outside, absolutely. Um, I think during COVID, gardening mm -hmm. really kind of, well, this is what I did during COVID. I read a lot of books and I <coughs> weeded my garden a lot. <laughs> and and I, I, you know, I really um, found it restorative to be outside yeah. in a time where uh, COVID made me feel really claustrophobic. Um, you know, just that feeling of being trapped. And so being, being outside really mattered to me, starting to think about changes in our lives that um, would, were sustainable. Um, and again, traveling back and forth by plane from one side of the country to the other on a regular basis, if you don't have to, is that's not, um, if you're trying to think of sustainable activities and if you're worrying about climate, flying is a problem and, right. you know, cutting down on that and making certain choices, getting electric car, doing, you know, because I think there was this strange collision of COVID and my awareness of climate change that really hit me. It was like, oh my God, what is going on in this mm -hmm. world of ours? And um, trying to make choices that were s smart. Um, yeah you know, both for my mental health <laughs> and also for things, you know, making choices that felt like the right choice for our, our world, even in small ways, you know, I think the small ways matter. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and I feel like everyone's temperature is so different. And so everyone's ability to contribute to that is very different and individual. So it's important to do it in small ways. I think sometimes to feel like it's realistic, it's difficult to right. make grand gestures and grand change. And Right. Feel. I think that it, it's easy to get discouraged if you think, all right, I have to stop the oceans rising, <laughs> but instead to think, you know, I can make certain choices that are manageable and they all matter. They all yeah. really matter. Um, but I think that I took my greatest pleasure over the last year or so is getting a new, getting another dog, which has kept us very busy as Same. you probably can tell. He's a little, um, high energy. Come here, Buck. Say hello. Hello. Hi, buddy. Hi. Oh, what kind of dog is he? He's a smooth Fox Terrier and oh, he is, he's super adorable. There he is. Hi. Oh, he's so cute. And he, he I think he sees himself on Instagram <laughs> Live. Like, I'm so handsome. <laughs> You've been oh. incredibly busy with having a, pu a puppy. Um, and it's meant that we've been outside even more because, you know, when you have you a have puppy, to. you're walking them 24 hours a day. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I think nurturing something was very, um, fulfilling, you know, having sure. a, a creature to take care of and, um, 
I mean, my son is at an age where he needs me a lot, but not like a baby. You know, he's 16. Right. So he needs me very partly to leave him alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> but just to know that you're there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I wrote a lot during COVID. Um, and I felt very lucky that uh, some people found it really hard to write and to create. Um, I would, I felt very lucky that to me, it, it was to some extent kind of stimulating. I, I felt like I had to put down in words what I was feeling and it helped me. Um, it also helped me, um, feel productive at a time yeah. where, you know, and putting the book together, writing the additional parts of the book. I mean, it felt, it felt really good to feel that I was doing something that created a sense of pr productivity. Purpose. Sure. And purpose. Yeah. I yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. That must have been nice to have that and have that create the outlet and feel cathartic. And yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, when you're in the middle of a time, I think one of the qualities of COVID was feeling helpless. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all felt helpless because to some degree we were, we are, and doing something that felt like I could, I, I really could be productive, um, help balance that feeling of helplessness. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. When you also mentioned, I know that um, you probably don't have a lot of time, so I won't ask you too many more questions, but you mentioned that you read a lot. And so I'm always curious what writers are reading. Is there anything that really stuck out to you? Oh, yeah. You well, I read a lot of fiction. Um, it's, I think people expect that I would read nonfiction because I write nonfiction, but mm -hmm. I, I think I um, just take a lot of um, enjoyment out of in disappearing into the worlds of fiction. And I read so many great books. Um, I just finished a phenomenal book called The Promise by Damon Galgut. That's amazing. Um, I read, um, let's see, what else did I read? I read uh, In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, which is actually nonfiction, but written in the most literate, literary way imaginable. So it reads okay. almost like a poem. I read um, Station Eleven by Emily um, Mandel, whose name, I'm sorry, I'm butchering her name. No. It's okay. Um, I feel like I do that all the time. I know. It's terrible. <laughs> I never okay. can remember said... authors. I remember the name oh. of the book more than I remember. That's the... okay. Yeah. Um, so I read tons of stuff that was just phenomenal. And then I did read some nonfiction that was great. I, I read Hidden Valley Road by yes. Robert Kolker. That was amazing. Um, I read, this is an old book, but I had never read it, um, Under the Banner of Heaven by oh John Krakauer. Oh my gosh, I love that book. Amazing, 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 yes. amazing book. Although I read it a, a lot late at night and it was so disturbing <laughs> that I would, nightmares. It, I mean, it really was like scary. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was such an intense book, but. I thought it was phenomenal. Just very interesting. Um, oh, fascinating and tragic and just yeah. amazing. Um, yeah. So I read and read and read. It was great. Again, awesome. I know some people who said they couldn't concentrate during COVID sure. and they couldn't read. So I feel lucky that to me it was my refuge that yeah. I just thought. I'm going into my book now. <laughs> I don't have to deal with the crazy world we live in. I'm just shutting it off. I love that. Well, is there anything that you're working on or that we can look forward to? I know that you have your New Yorker pieces. Um, is there anything that, like, that you can tell us about? Yeah. Well, a few things. Actually, um, some exciting things. Uh, one thing I did during COVID is 
I worked on a television show and it just uh, launched uh, this weekend. Oh my goodness. It's the second season um, of a show called How To with John Wilson. Oh, how fun. And it's really fantastic. So I- Amazing, I'll every- be watching. It's on HBO and it's really great. Um, I just started a new project for the New Yorker. I'm writing an obituary column. I saw that. Yeah, that so cool. it's really, I mean, it satisfies my constant curiosity because there's nothing like an obituary to allow you to sort of learn about someone's life. So yes. I'm very excited about that. I love and, that. Um, and I'm uh, writing a memoir, which oh, is... Cool crazy and i'm working on the television adaptation of the library book oh wow that's amazing yeah. so, so cool. i'm i'm um you're not very at all. busy <laughs> i'm very busy which is that's amazing like i feel lucky but i am very busy <laughs> sure well i'm i'm we're so lucky to be able to have your works out there and to continue to read you and support you and um, and also just say thank you because I know that you are so busy to take the time and sit and, you know, chat with all of us. And, um, I know that this has just been such a fun read, not only reading, but listening to you in the audible, um, was just such a treat. I really oh, enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. As you know, those doing recording the audio book is a whole other <laughs> enterprise and yes. I, I enjoyed doing it very much. So I'm glad. And, you know, people are really responding to audiobooks. Um, so yeah. that's that been a real, a real treat to be able to, to be the narrator, especially <laughs> in a book like this. Yes. Well, I hope you continue to, ha you know, I hope you have the time to do your next books because it is such a treat to listen to you and um, just really get a different perspective of your stories and your work. It's really fun. So oh, thank thanks. you very much. Thank yeah. you. Well, this has <laughs> been a real pleasure and I'm, I'm really, really um, so appreciative of your enthusiasm for the book and for the chance to chat with you. Yes, thank you so much. And um, I can't wait to, you know, continue to, to read your obit piece because I'm very, I love reading New York Times obits and just seeing it through your eyes gets me just so excited. And also you're, um, I can't wait to watch the show and just, again, pick up all your new books. So I'm really excited. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jen. Thank it was you. such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Nice to meet you in person. And Virtual. Likewise. <laughs> no, I, it was wonderful. And my Thank dogs you. say goodbye and, and oh. are, they apologize for their noisiness. No so. apologies necessary. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. Care. You too.